Welcome to Be The Wellness Podcast, where we help you master your body, mind, and the experience of life through insightful conversation, interviews with experts and thought leaders, all with a side of marital banter and some good old-fashioned humor. Yes, we are your hosts, Adam and Vanessa Lambert, and we're committed to helping you live life fully expressed physically, mentally, and experientially. Sit back, grab a cup of coffee, and join the conversation. Welcome back, folks. Here we are on the air again. <laughs> Soon to be on the road again. On the road again. <laughs> yeah. Actually, when this comes out, we are officially on the road. We are officially traveling somewhere, which is crazy. You know, we've been completely grounded for six months. Yeah. I mean, yeah. when we got back from Costa, Costa Rica. Rica and- in December. Yeah. I mean, we had a trip. You know, we've been out to Joshua Tree. We went to Utah. But I mean, as far as like you know, going somewhere. Real traveling. Yeah. Yeah. So we're, we're, when you hear this, we'll be in Puerto Rico for a couple of weeks, um, taking a much needed, I don't know, I I guess break. I mean, we're just pulling a geographic. (laughs) We're pulling a geographic. Yeah. 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 So we're going to be doing all the same stuff just in a different place. It's just time. Yeah. And you know, we, um, we may, I don't know if we've told the story or not, but probably, you know, actually probably haven't because it's been kind of just an unfolding story to be fair. But I think about six months ago, it was in November, um, Adam and I were in our backyard and we were actually doing a little rapé, which is um, tobacco. And it's, um, you know, something that we've experienced during plant medicine ceremonies. And it's really just a little bit of tobacco. You blow it in your nose, kind of like snuff, I guess people would say. And, uh, but it's very, very grounding and it can kind of just help you if you've got a lot of energy moving around. And I was feeling a little fragmented in that moment. We did some rapé and it really just kind of pulled out some emotions. And I had this moment of clarity, which was, that we needed to go spend time with my mom in Northern California, which was shocking to me, by the way. And, uh, you know, obviously we believe in plans. We um, have had wonderful experience with getting guidance from plant medicine. And this tobacco is one of those things. It's not psychedelic by any, by any stretch, but there's something very spiritual about it in its own way. And I remember saying to Adam, like, I feel like we're supposed to go up to Northern California and spend some time yeah. know, with my mom. Yeah. And I mean, this was kind of coming on the heels of us coming back from our five week road trip that included the Montana retreat. And we'd been in nature a lot Yeah, and coming back into LA and Venice felt really small mm-hmm. and like intense. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, it, it could, because it is, yes. I mean, you just kind of get used to the ambient you know, intensity. And right. then, but when you leave for an extended period of time and come back, it can be a little bit overwhelming. So it was, yeah, everything was just kind of stacking up. It was like, all right, it's time to, there's you something, know, yeah, something, needs, something happen. Yeah. And it was, you know, it was very strange because obviously we've been in Venice for 10 years and the idea of leaving what the fact that leaving sounded like a good idea was really shocking to both of us. Yeah. But there was something about that moment of clarity and we were getting ready to do two back to back trips in Costa Rica. And we just said, you know, we've been living in our place in Venice for 10 years. And there was just like this amalgamation of energy that was like, you know, I think it's just time to pull up our roots and we put everything in storage and we just, you know, we took the dogs up to my mom's because we were going to be traveling to Costa Rica for the next month or so. And we were just like, let's just get ourselves mobile and figure out when we get back from Costa Rica, what we're going to do. If we're just going to get a different place in Venice or just like yeah. what's going to happen. But for some reason, it just felt right to get ourselves sorted, get ourselves pulled up. And, you know, fast forward, we came back from our second round to Costa Rica. And, you know, not that long after all the coronavirus stuff kicked in. Yeah. And we just felt like, wow, we're kind of in the perfect this place. This is the best, po- best possible place to be. <laughs> best possible yeah. place to be. Yeah. And it's just yeah. so crazy. And we were like, who would have thought that, you know, but something, the fact that both of us were in agreement that we should do this, that we should leave Venice was just like bizarre enough in itself. And then 
it just felt like, okay, we're supposed to come up here. Yeah. And so we, we did. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, we came up and then, you know, it's always a function of like, who's going to babysit the dogs right. while we're gone. Yeah. You know, that we trust that, you know, yeah. You know, especially with Penelope getting older, it mm-hmm. was like, all right, you know, we just need to kind of handle this stuff. Right. Yeah. And then it was a function of, well, we're going to travel. We'll take the, to a little road trip right before we go to Peru. And then, bam, everything changed, you know, yeah. like the beginning of March, middle of March, it was like, now we're in an entirely different world, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it's been just a really interesting period. And then fast forward. So, you know, it's been this really strange process of like being like, this is so weird. I'm in my hometown where I grew up, which is, you know, when I left my hometown, it was like, I kind of just didn't look back, you know, Mm -hmm. and I just sort of was like that part of my life is over. And to be fair, coming back here has been really healing for me in a lot of ways. It's kind of, um, given me an opportunity to revisit some of my childhood, some of the things that were shaping and formative for me growing up here and to kind of just get complete with some of the energy around my life here. Right. And, you know, on top of it, like when we got here, well, I think both of us were just exhausted mm-hmm. in a way that was surprising to us. And we yeah. just, I mean, I think I slept for like 10 hours a day for three months or something. Yeah. Yeah, you did. You know, so this was actually going to be an intro to another podcast. <laughs> but now we're rolling. But I think we're rolling in <laughs> yep. the, because this was ultimately something we wanted to talk about anyway. So, I agree. Yep. <laughs> so if you were thinking we were going to introduce a guest. You're you were wrong. wrong. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think, you know, kind of talking about the like one of the things that we really liked about Venice specifically when we when we moved there was that there everybody was up to something. Mm-hmm. You know, everyone you talk to is an entrepreneur, they're uh, or an actor. You know, it's yeah. just kind of that whole thing, right? But but everybody's got stuff going on, and they're all you know charging ahead with different ideas, and you know hit a roadblock and pivot and do and just go and go and go and go juxtaposed with the kind of bohemian artist surfer town, you know, situation, right. Which was like perfect for for us us in that moment. It's like exactly what we were doing, where we were with our business. And, you know, so there's a lot of upside to that. And frankly, I would like to go back to that at some point, Yeah, yeah. (laughs) but you know, the, the outcome the result of all that was that we were pretty beat up Mm -hmm. pretty tired, you know? And it's like, I've talked about this a little bit before, maybe on the podcast, I don't know, certainly on the phone with people, <laughs> the words have come, <laughs> the words out. Have come out of my mouth <laughs> where, you know, when people ask, they're like, Oh, well, do you miss, do you miss the job? How's things going since you left the fire department? And frankly, it was the answer always was, man, I don't even think about it, you mm-hmm. know? And a big part of that was because we just, you know, the, there was a, there was like a pressure point that was occurring when I left the job. And that was that I did not have enough time to do both well. Mm -hmm. And so when I just left and jumped full on into the business, I didn't even think about anything else because we were so busy and just doing our thing. Right. And having this time, you know, like when you were sleeping 10 or 12 hours a night, Mm -hmm. it really gave us that, that kind of reprieve to like, exhale a little bit and Mm -hmm. be like, Oh man. Okay. Yeah. So nobody around here is doing 16 hour days on the computer. (laughs) You know, it's like, what are we doing? You know? Yeah. And something that's really interesting that's come from that is that it's given me an opportunity to think about leaving the job and like really put some thought into the difference between what it is now and and what I was doing before. And, And so some things have kind of come up from that, you know, which is, which is, I guess, just goes to show how busy we were. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yes. And how just nonstop the the brain was just turning. Like if we weren't meditating, and frankly, when we're meditating, we're usually meditating on something business related. <laughs> you know, but <laughs> yeah, when yeah. when not meditating and not surfing, it's, the it's all business revving. all the time. Yeah. You know? And so it's been a really interesting six months. <laughs> it it has. To, to sort of you know, I mean, some of, because some of that stuff, some of the business related things have just been put on hold because there's nothing to do. And nobody's just not even certain of what, you know, the industries are going to look like. Right. And so it's like, uh, it's just the big pause. Yeah. It's been the great pause. Yeah. And it's like, 
you know, for so many of us, I think that we were all just going, 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 and it's just given us all a chance to just pause, reflect, look at how we've been living our life, how we've been orchestrating our days Mm -hmm. and just think about, you know, is this, and I talk about this all the time, you know, with my authentic selfies and with my mastermind group, like, how do you want to spend your time? Like literally that the, the credits of your life, what do you want to use them on? Mm -hmm. Um, and before we get too far down that rabbit hole though, I do want to ask, so what are the, what are the reflections that you came up on leaving your job and Mm. What are the things that come to this? Yeah. So, I I mean, I I think the, as like an overarching theme, what I'm really recognizing is that even though I, I knew this, like I saw this potential, right. When I was still working, um, of this, this problem, uh, or what I perceived as a problem of, of people really identifying themselves with the job in a way that they don't really exist outside of it. Right. Mm -hmm. So I am this person, Mm -hmm. I am chief Lambert, right. Right. As opposed to when I go to work, I'm a chief officer and this is what I do. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I was really cognizant of that, um, throughout, especially like the last 10, 15 years, (laughs) you know, of (laughs) of the career, because ultimately what you see, and this isn't, you know, this isn't a dig against people who have, you know, who has played out this way for, but what you see is these guys that retire for a couple of years and either come back because they're like, damn dude, I just, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. Right. Cause a, a lot of guys retire relatively young, 50 mm-hmm. to, you know, 55. And then if they don't do that, they come and hang out at the fire station. <laughs> you, know <what> I mean? <laughs> so you get all these retired guys coming and, and wanting to tell you how to do your business, you know? <laughs> and so it's like, why can't you just let it go? You know? And mm-hmm. so for me, it was always this thing of like, man, there's no way that when I get to that point, I want to be not having something else going on. I want to always have something else in my life so that I don't feel, you know, the, the urge to go pester people at the fire station. You know? <laughs> yep. And, um, and so what that, what that sort of, I think boils down to is that there's a, there's a sense of meaning and purpose that is built into that job. Right. So Mm -hmm. you, when you're a firefighter, you feel like you're doing something important. You are doing something important. There's no doubt about it, but you really feel like you are and you get a tremendous amount of agreement and support from the general community. Right. Mm -hmm. Because people, when people say, Oh, what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm, you know, a chief officer for such and such fire department. Oh, wow, Mm -hmm. man. Thanks for what you do. Right. There's like, there's a tremendous amount of, of support for that. Right. So I've never really had to manufacture my own meaning, Mm. you know, since I was 18 years old. Mm -hmm. And, and that is something that I'm finding now, you know, and when we were, you know, when I left the job and we're just straight into the business, it's like, oh, this is who I am. I'm, you know, the, the COO or whatever of this thing. And this is, this is what I do. This is the meaning that I'm, you know, the, the thing I'm doing in the world is creating this, you know, I mean, transformational experiences and coaching and whatever. Um, but then when that goes away or at mm-hmm. least slows down to a point that you get a chance to catch your breath, then I've kind of been left with this thought of like, Oh, all right. So now what am I doing? Mm-hmm. You know, and especially not being in Venice. Right. So that whole thing, like that whole conversation, if you were in Venice, people are like, Hey, what are you up to? I'm like, Oh, we have this company that does this and this and this. And people get it for one. Cause there's a lot of other entrepreneurs and they're like, man, that's a cool idea. How are you guys doing X, Y, and Z? And so you can just roll right into this identification of me being this person who does this thing. Right. It's totally different here, mm-hmm. you know, and like being up here, a, nobody asks you what you do because <laughs> nobody no cares. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, we haven't had contact with a lot yeah. of people, but it's just less of a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Like conversations don't start with what do you do for a living? Yeah, you know, right. it's more like, I don't know. What's in your garden? <laughs> what's in your garden? Yeah, exactly. You know, it's like, oh, what do you think about the, the weather? I mean, because people talk about the weather in yeah. Northern California. Yeah, totally. So it's been a, it's been kind of interesting to be sort of confronted with, you know, I, well, A, identifying that I got a lot more meaning and sort of purpose out of the job than I wanted to admit to mm-hmm. myself, you know, mm-hmm. and then trying to figure out, you know, how to, how to manufacture that for myself and, um, in doing what I'm doing. And I know, uh, the book deep work, I can't remember the guy's name who wrote it, but 
great, fantastic book. He also wrote Digital Minimalism, which came right afterwards. Also a fantastic book. But his whole thing about deep work is that, um, and deep work meaning like flow state, you can focus on what you're doing. It's like you're, you're all in on, on whatever the task is. And his assertion is that meaning is an emergent property of deep work. Mm -hmm. So if you are truly into something, you, you'll manufacture your own meaning around it, right? And he gives great examples in the book of people who, and, and the, the meaning thing is important because we just know that if you're doing a job day in and day out that you don't feel is important or doesn't give you some agency, it doesn't give you some buy-in to being a contributor in the world, that plays kind of hard against your overall happiness, mm -hmm, right? It's, mm -hmm. I think it's just kind of a known thing. And so his assertion is that if you can find the deep work, then it solves so many problems, mm -hmm. so many of these existential sort of angst problems that we have around, you know, what am I doing? What's my purpose on the earth? You know, and he gives all these great examples, one being a guy who's a, a blacksmith that makes swords. Mm hmm. And you're like, how relevant is that? Like, what's the market? <laughs> you know what I mean? If you're like, I'm going to change the world by making swords, right. you know, in 2020. Right. Um, the, it doesn't, it seems like a niche for sure. And, <laughs> yeah. but the, but the point is that the, the level of attention and the work and the detail and everything that goes into the way that he does this is so detailed that he can't not be in this deep work sort of state, this mm -hmm, flow state, mm -hmm. and apparently derives a tremendous amount of meaning from it. So I guess that's my point. Yeah. So, so now for me, it's about finding that deep work aspect of what we do in our business, mm -hmm, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, it's very interesting, you know, because we have been in such a hustle for so long and this has been the time where the hustle doesn't matter. Yeah. Like, you know True. what I mean? Hustle like, all you want. You hustle all you <laughs> want. But like the fact remains that we're in the great pause, you know? And so it's been a really interesting time to just look at what the energy of activity represents, mm. the energy of creation and the energy of, of like, for me, I think it's, um, it's definitely for the recognizing the role that that creation plays in my self meaning. Mm. And I think that it's been really interesting to just recognize how long I've been in creation mode. I mean, you know, I've had a job since I was nine years old. So I've been literally working since I was yeah. a, a, a child. And I right. think there's probably a lot of laws against this now, but <laughs> no, but hey, it's a different, different time. You know, back in the eighties. Um and I've just been in creation mode and hustle mode and generation mode for mm -hmm. so long. And I've just gotten so much, like you're saying, agreement and uh, validation mm -hmm. from being the kind of person who generates all the time. And so for me, this process of just going, you know, it doesn't matter how many good ideas I have right now. It doesn't matter how organized I can be about them, how meticulous I can be about the creation of them. The fact of the matter is that they, it doesn't matter because there's no way to produce it. Mm -hmm. You know, the production line is down, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's been really, really interesting to just pull back and recognize. So who am I separate of what I create? And what is my value? And do I love and respect and appreciate myself if I'm not generating? Right. And it's been such an emotional experience to be in because I've had to really just distinguish whether I love me for just mm. being me. Right. Or if there has to be a value association with who I'm being in the world and what I'm creating for others in order to love myself. And it's been such a profound experience to actually get to the point where I'm like, wow, I love and deeply accept myself even if I'm doing nothing. Yeah. That's tough. It's pretty wild. Yeah. 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 It, <laughs> you know, and the, the thing is that it's um, like what you're saying is so 
I, I mean, I think a lot of people can probably resonate with that, right? Because I mean, all of the things that we are, at least our generation, and I don't know how it is, maybe it's different for other generations, but there's very much a pull yourself up by your bootstraps and work ethic. And, you know, if you want something, then figure out how to attain it. And that usually means, some, you know, generating something, some kind of work or whatever. And so it's, and it's not wrong. You know what I mean? It's like, it's a hundred percent, right? Like the, you know, if you, uh, if you want to get something done, work ethic really makes a big difference and that, you know, just constant production. Right. But what has been, I think, left out of the conversation for our generation to a large degree is that, and, and maybe it wouldn't have mattered, you know, in, in the beginning, but we're in a different world now, mm -hmm. right? Like the kind of older paradigm of find something that you don't mind doing and do it until you're old enough to draw your retirement and then go live your life. Mm -hmm. That, that really has changed. Yeah. You know I mean? That's yeah. not the American dream anymore. No. Like the, not for Americans anyway. There's a, there's a yeah. ton of, there's a ton of people immigrating to the company who, or to the company, to the country. <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> like that. It's kind of funny. <laughs> yeah. um, who, who that is the dream. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and it, it's a reflection of the lack of opportunity in the places that they came from. Right. And so some people would say, oh, well, you guys just, you know, you're all soft because you've been here and all of this. And you're like, well, that's one way to look at it. But there's also, you know, what if it's just the natural evolution of, you know, access to, to resources, right? Yeah. Like eventually you, that drive is, becomes less important because you're like, hey, actually, you know, I can get away with just doing X, Y, and Z and still live comfortably. And then I have all this other time to do to explore things like who am I without my job, right? <laughs> right. You know, so we get to kind of circle back around to this, to this point. But the, where I was going with that is that we, we got all of these skills around hard work, right. And how to achieve and what this sort of magic pie in the sky ideal looks like, but we have not really gotten a lot of tools or even conversations around what does that mean for, for you as the person, you know, like what else is there to, to measure yourself by or to, um, I don't know, identify with, mm. you know, if it's not, if it's not work and then it's like, exactly like you said, you know, who am I absent of this thing that I do? Yeah. You know, and it's a, it, it's a, it's kind of a, I have a feeling that this whole thing is sort of like cyclical and maybe even like parabolic from a curve perspective. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you're in, um, if you're the, the rickshaw driver in India, you know, it's like maybe you get five, 10 rides a day, something like that. You know, what are you doing the rest of the time? Mm -hmm. You know, the rest of the time you are, you, you're mm -hmm. communing, you're jibber jabbering with the other rickshaw drivers. You're, you know, you go home to your family and everybody does everything together. Cause it's like, it's just a way to do something, but it's not really like, and I don't know, cause I've obviously never done this, but it doesn't <laughs> feel like that's a huge identity. Mm. You know, you are Larry and this is your family. And I don't know how many Indian rickshaw drivers are named Larry, but <laughs> this is your family and this is everything. So you talk to this guy and he's like, no, this is me. This is my little spot. I, this is, I'm the happiest guy in the world, blah, 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 blah you know, which I actually saw on the documentary happy yeah, yeah. where this whole comes, comes from. And he happens to have a rickshaw, mm -hmm. right? So that guy, let's say makes it to America, goes to school, becomes a doctor. Now, all of a sudden he's a doctor mm -hmm. and his family is like, my son is a doctor, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And there's this identification all of a sudden with that. And then two generations of doctors happen, you know, Larry's grandson is like on the road to being a doctor. And he's like, I don't want to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. I'm me. Yeah. I'm going to do this thing in the world because right. now you're in a place where the resources, the mindset, all of that stuff has evolved to a point that you don't need that identity. Right. 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 Yeah. It's a trip. Yeah. I mean, identity drives so much of what we do. Right. So I think a collective pause in the things that we normally identify with is, you know, put us all kind of in a place to 
zoom out and think about who we are. And I think that, you know, that can be very, very uncomfortable for some people. And Mm -hmm. I mean, it's been uncomfortable for us in our own way. But, you know, when you look at the rates of suicide and the levels Mm -hmm. of depression and all the things that have come out of this time. Yeah. You know, people sitting with themselves right. is very uncomfortable. Oh, for sure. It, it's yeah. like it's some of the most uncomfortable work you can do. And so, you know, this time where we're all having to collectively just be in ourselves, mm-hmm. you know, it, it can be a, a pressure cooker for some people. But, you know, for us and for me personally, I can only speak for myself. It's been such like I it, it's been such a crazy time because I literally just have gotten to the point probably in the last month where I'd fully settled into it. I'm like, okay, I'm just in full acceptance of being here, being in the now, being in the moment, accepting what is here for us in this time and not forcing it, not fighting against it, not, you know, or trying to hurry through it. Mm hmm. And, you know, and then it's like, all right, I feel like I accepted that level. Then Penelope Mm -hmm. died and it was like, okay, wow, here's a whole nother level of being present yeah, and accepting the time and being in the moment. And now my mom has sold her house (laughs) and there's this sense of like, oh, wait, I just completely accepted that like we're just supposed to be here right now and we're meant to just, you know, settle fully into this moment. And now the world is shifting again. And, you know, my mom has been in this house for 20 years. So this has been kind of our family house that, you know, we have our holidays at. It's just been sort of this, um, I don't know, this kind of safety zone for anyone going through anything, anything going on. We call it the sanctuary. Like it's just been this place where friends and family alike can just pop in and and retreat to. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just been the safety zone of like, oh, okay, well, if all else fails in the world, we'll just go here and wait out the storm. Yeah. Well, (laughs) it turns out the bunker has been sold off. (laughs) (laughs) So there's just this really, really interesting experience of like, okay, we're going one more level of surrender, you know, yeah. one more level of like, okay, the that very last, you know, piece of surrender or piece of safety has just been like, has been, has been, is being dissolved. Yeah. So it's just like, you know, just when you think the lesson couldn't take one more level, right. it's taking one more level. And yeah. it's just been so interesting because, you know, when that happened, my mom's house was a 30 day escrow. It's like, we really had no idea what we're doing because we just kind of settled into like, oh, okay, I guess we're just going right. to be here for a while until, yeah. you know, until this whole thing kind of sorts itself out. Yeah. Well, it was that weird in between of like, okay, the, okay, the curve has flattened right. with COVID. Right. We're, we're moving along. There's maybe there's going to be some reprieve over the summer. We're going to see, you know, something change. So it felt like we were on the precipice of something Mm -hmm. changing and kind of going back to normal. Right. You know, and then and so it was almost like, okay, well, you know, the house sells. Everything goes back to normal. We just kind of do our thing. And then it's like, no, actually, the house sells. Nothing goes back to normal. (laughs) Everything. In fact, maybe backsliding in some areas. (laughs) Penelope's going to go ahead and, and bail out. She's just like, dude, she's 2020, like, I'm, not I'm, this I'm, not, I'm not doing this. 2021 might be super weird. Yeah. I'm, I'm just going to take this opportunity to exit. You yeah. Know? And, it, you know, well, the thing about it is, is like what it's really brought into my reality is that like, you know, I teach about surrender. I teach about acceptance. I teach about mm-hmm. allowance. I teach about all of these things. And it's like, in the end, you have to just, you have to come complete with, do you believe what you teach or not? Right. And this has been such a important time for me to go, do you believe what you teach? D- is yeah. that real? And it's just so crazy because in the end, I'm like, it really is real for me. Like I really trust. Yeah. I really accept. I really believe that I am a divine child of God that is completely protected and cared for and that everything is exactly how it's supposed to be for my highest development. And for me to be the most kind and compassionate and loving person, not only towards myself, but as a teacher and as someone who can help really be compassionate and empathize 
with people when they're going through these corners of such discomfort. Mm -hmm. And it's been such a amazing, beautiful gift to go, wow, like I actually really do believe in this stuff, you know? And even though, uh, Two weeks ago, if you said, well, what are you guys doing next? It's this really strange thing of like, we could basically do whatever we want, but like, right. what do we want to do? do? <laughs> yeah. So strange, you know, tr- like normally you'd be like, oh, well, I guess we'll just travel for a bit or do our thing. Well, okay. Traveling is kind of strange right now. And yeah, so we got this invitation to Puerto Rico from our friends that just was like a perfect time and just felt like, yeah, that's exactly what we should do. And, you know, I um, also am getting the opportunity to go do plant medicine at Soul Quest in Florida, which is, you know, one of the only legal ayahuasca facilities here in the state. So just it's just crazy because like this full surrender is just leading to what is supposed to happen next. And like, we're just in this full acceptance of trusting that the next steps are going to be shown as exactly how they're supposed to be. Yeah. Well, so the thing about it to me that is, um, well, I don't know. It's all interesting, but the, like my experience with getting thrown curveballs in, uh, you know, that, cause like essentially that's what my last job was. Right. Like someone somewhere gets thrown a curveball and they call 911 and we show up and knock that curveball out of the park, mm-hmm, you know, and mm-hmm. it's like one curveball after another is like literally what you train for, you know. And so you almost like you just expect it to some degree. You're like, OK, something, you know, here's the plan. But of course, it's not going to go like that. You know, <laughs> like it's going to be there's going to be something else that comes along the way, you know. So it's like. It's an, this, this whole experience has been, has been kind of like that, Mm -hmm. you know, it reminds me of, you know, being on a, on a fire that is like not necessarily going as planned, right? Like everything that can go wrong. It's almost like one of the simulation drills that they do that just is like designed to frustrate and like you literally can't win, you know? (laughs) So like the better you do, the harder the simulation gets. Right, right. And that's what it reminds me of. It's like a, it's like an ICS 420 drill. You know, you're like, okay, now the cyborgs are attacking from the left, you know, and you're like cyborgs, where did the, oh, okay, fine, whatever cyborgs, you know, and that, that's just so far what this whole thing is like, you know, and it's a little bit weird to me because it's, I've had a really hard time getting worried about it, mm. you know, and it's yeah. like, okay, we'll just roll with the punches and we'll do this. So, okay, explain to me what exactly this new problem is. Oh, you literally can't do the business that you used to do in the way that you used to do it. Okay, how can we do it? Don't know yet. <laughs> okay, um, so we'll just wait, you know, yep. and, we'll, and when new information comes, we'll make this change. And when this happens, we make this change. And, you know, you just kind of keep going through it. And, you know, in the in the past, I would say that, um, in my work life, that was easy enough because it was never your emergency. Mm. Right. I mean, that's kind of the deal It's like, you're there to solve a problem and you didn't cause the problem. And so you're going to do everything that you possibly can to, to make it the best for everybody, you know, but it's not your problem yeah. at the end of the day. Right. Yeah. And, and so when things went awry in my personal life, that was my problem. And it was like, oh, so it was harder for me to kind of apply the same level of rolling with the punches and just dealing with the curveballs. But for some reason, in this circumstance with this, this whole thing with COVID and all of the stuff that's been going on, I've just, I've had a really hard time um, caring about it. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, mm-hmm. I mean, obviously I, I care deeply about what's going on and, and the, the strife that people are experiencing and all of the stuff that's going on. It's not like that. It's just that I don't, I'm having a hard time worrying about it. Yeah. I'm like, okay, well, we'll, we'll figure, we'll it, figure out. it out. Like you said, we've got a hundred percent success rate of figuring it out. Like, yeah. We've never not figured it out. You yeah. know? <laughs> so it's just a matter of, of kind of continuing to roll with it. And, and it's, um, Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I really hear what you're saying about kind of testing the ideals or not not even ideals, but the, you know, the processes that you have, you know, it's been, it's been a good opportunity to test all of that. I mean, from everything, like what you're saying about your own belief systems about how this whole thing works and all the way down to the business systems that you have in place to 
protect against things that you would have never even imagined could possibly happen. And then you're like, oh, okay, well, man, I'll tell you what, if you, if I, I think I can say this with hundred percent confidence, if you are in the travel industry right now and you survive yeah. through COVID, yeah. you had some good business practices in place, yeah. Yeah. you know? Mm-hmm. And that this system is getting tested. It's I mean, getting really tested. even <laughs> even all the way up at the at the level of multinationals and the relationships that they have with specific countries. Yeah, right. I mm-hmm. mean, there's there are airlines who are threatening countries, basically saying if you don't sort out what you've got going on at your borders, we are going to stop flying to your country. Yeah, you know, and like. Yeah. That's huge, right? It's so huge. For, in a lot of the places that we go rely heavily on tourism, obviously. And so like it's a it's a very interesting time. Yeah. You know, like the the, the as you said, the, the pressure cooker is being turned up. Turned you know? up, yep. <laughs> and there's there's an interesting aspect of that in that if you don't have the clout of, you know, American Airlines or mm-hmm. whatever, if you're not a American might be a bad example, actually. But, then, <laughs> you know, if you don't, if you're not packing the punch of one of these massive um, companies, it's, it's even more difficult, right? You mm-hmm. don't have a huge, um, you don't have a big hammer, right? right? You're just trying to figure out how to work within the, whatever this new system that's going to be created. And that's where a lot of companies fall, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. that's where we fall a, a lot of our partners in various countries and stuff. I mean, this is, they're really being squeezed, mm-hmm. you know, and mm-hmm. it's, it's interesting to see, I just have this like running sort of checks and balances of like decisions that we've made and places that we've chosen to invest in partnerships that we've developed. And I'm actually, I'm, I feel like this was a great opportunity to like test our vetting system, Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. because like, how else do you really know? You know, when you, when you partner with companies in other countries and in this country, even, and everything's great all the time, right? you never really know if you made that good of a decision, right? right? Like everything's always worked out. Everything's been fine, but we've never really had any adversity. Yeah. And now here we are with like the ultimate adversity. Right. And I can say that the partners that we have are amazing. Yeah. They're keeping it together. Everybody's nobody's bankrupt. Everybody's yeah. just keeping it straight. And yeah. the communication and the level of, you know, compassion toward care. each other mm-hmm. and care mm-hmm. uh, that is is it's really it's really good. It's really like high level integrity stuff. And so yeah. I'm like, I don't know. I mean, I and I guess maybe where I'm where I'm going with this is that with all of the what could be deemed negatives that have right. come out of all of this it's really given us an opportunity to look at the system that we've built and check it against, you know, the, the adversity. And Mm. it's, and so when some big hit comes, I can look at the other side of it and be like, okay, here comes the hit. How are we handling it? Oh, it's this and this and this, how are they handling it? This and this and this, that's a win, Mm -hmm. you know? So there's like this balance of, you know, pros and cons that are happening here that I think is what might be, you know, making it more fun for me. <laughs> more entertaining <laughs> like, at least. Yeah, you know, because what else are you going to do? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, no, it is. I mean, honestly, it's been it's been really all all of those things and this is where like it all interplays together, right? Because there's like this tremendous level of integrity that you invest in within yourself and within the companies you work with and all that stuff, but then there's also like this amazing level of trust in like the energetic protection and like the energetic, um, you know, container that it's all Mm -hmm. held in. And it it is really interesting just to be in it almost as just an observation, like, wow, this is very interesting to watch this all play out and not, you know, and just, and just see that it's all okay. It's, it's all going to be fine. It's all going to work out. You know, it's just that, Everyone is being asked to be patient. Yeah. And that is the very interesting thing is that the whole thing hinges on everybody just being patient. Yeah. And you're like, wow, that's a very interesting universal lesson that like the 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 lesson at hand is patience. Like, right. can we be patient with each other? Can we be um, compassionate with the timeline yeah. of things? Like, can we just have hold that space for each other? Right. And that's really the lesson at hand. And you're like, wow, that's a pretty interesting universal lesson that we're all going through right now. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's, you know, there, there's definitely an aspect to this that isn't 
like super rosy or that I'm that that I could imagine people would have a really hard time finding the silver lining in. And that is where this this patience um, comes in conflict with our medical system. Mm -hmm, Right. So mm -hmm. like there's some terrible things going on where folks are not being allowed to visit, Mm -hmm. you know, loved ones in the hospital and they're missing they're not, they don't get to be there when their loved one dies, you know, and Mm -hmm. all of this kind of stuff. Right. And so there is this like uh, at the global, you know, at the 30,000 or maybe even like low earth orbit level, there's this patience and compassion message, right. That's, that's kind of resonating there, but man, are there some like pain points in here where patience, you're being patient with a system Mm -hmm. that is, operating blindly in a lot of, in a lot of ways, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I just really, like, I don't have anything to say about that other than I just feel so deeply for people who are in that position Yeah. of, you know, not, not a matter of like, Oh, is my business going to survive? But no, my mother is dying Mm -hmm. and I can't be with her in the hospital, you know, like fuck, you know? And so, yeah. And then like, imagine you also, you know, think coronavirus is a hoax or you know what I mean? Like yeah. if you're in those positions, right, 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 right. Where you're like on this one far extreme side of this really isn't even a problem. And this make believe problem is preventing me from, you know, spending the last hours with a loved one mm, or whatever. Yeah. Gee, many Christmas. Yeah. It's being, so everything, you know, the way that this just keeps occurring to me is that everything, all of our deepest, darkest fears, all of the things that we are scared of that we think could be the hardest to deal with all of the things that are like those deep darknesses in ourselves are being pulled up and Mm -hmm. we're having to look at them, you know, like the most difficult, I could say that this last few months, even though there's been a sense of total surrender and acceptance to it, it has been really hard. Yeah. It's been, you know, it's been so hard. And I know so many of you out there probably feel the same. Like, even in spite of being able to accept it, even in spite of being able to see the the good things or look on the bright side, there's no doubt that all of us are going through the paces on this thing. And the things that are being pulled to the surface are are some of the most difficult lessons of our life. Right. And I find it just no coincidence that Penelope chose this time to exit and that we had to deal with that too. Mm -hmm. It's like literally the most difficult things are being pulled out for us to just look at and go, all right, so who are you in the face of these things? What are you really made of in these moments? Yeah, totally. And something that we've, or I certainly have noticed since, I mean, so it's been like two weeks to the day that Penelope has been gone. Mm -hmm. And like, I didn't realize how much I relied on her. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm. As being like, if you're having a down moment, if you're having like any little hiccup in your sort of space in the day, you could just go pick Penelope up for a couple of minutes and, you know, hug her and run around and everything. And she would just absorb it, you know? And it's, I mean, and nothing against Daisy. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but Daisy's, she's just not quite the. She's just, she's just not quite the. Uh, <laughs> the not, love not, energizer. Not quite so absorbent. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> she's got her own skill set. She does. You know, but but there was really something about that, you know, mm-hmm. and so, and so it's in. I guess where I was going with that is that yeah, there's the added grief of dealing with the death and the loss, but then it's almost like it kicked out a support beam for sure. You know what I mean? It's like we lost one of the footings that we relied on yeah. heavily yeah. in our life, you know, and I'm sure that, you know, whether it's a dog or another person or a cat or a job or a whatever, like the, the, this is what seems to be happening is that like our foundations are eroding Yes, in 2020. You exactly. Know? No, yeah. I mean, and this is really, I think if like we're at the moment of this podcast right here, which is that like all that we have had to identify with ourselves, mm-hmm. to support ourselves, to create the semblance of security in our lives, it's all dissolving. Yeah. And what we are being left with is who we really are and mm-hmm. what we really believe. And like, this is actually what the moment is creating for us is 
like, who are you? Who yeah. are you without all of the bells and whistles, with all, all the trips, without all the chaos energy, without all of the things? Like, in the end, when you're sitting in the room with only yourself, do you like who you are? Do you, yeah. do you feel safe in your body? Do you respect who you've become in the world? Right. Do you know who you are? Do you yeah. know who you are? And like, that's why this is getting so uncomfortable for people is that a lot of times the answer is not so much. Yeah. You know, I don't actually love who I've become. I don't really know who I've become. I uh, don't really like who I am without all of the things that created my identity. Persona. Yeah. And, you know, this is tough work, people. Like, this is actually some of the deepest – talk about deep work. Mm -hmm. This is some of the deepest work we're going to do is to be confronted with ourselves. And, you know, we've not only been confronted with ourselves, but also the social pressure of where everyone wants us to push ourselves into yeah. the corners of identity. And like, you better, you're either for the mask or against the mask. Like right. you're either, you know, Democrat Black Lives or Matter or you're a racist. Like right. you were being also pushed to be like, oh shit, I better grab an identity really quick because like I, I'm yeah. my, my social status is being threatened. Like this is really really intense work we're being pushed into yeah, and to true. hold yourself in the face of this and to hold yourself in your own identity in your own voice and in your own belief system is some really intense um is some intense work right now it is and i think that um i think that the way forward is discipline and critical thought like i don't i just can't think of any other way to, to navigate this stuff. Mm. You know, it's like you have to be diligent and disciplined in your thought process because otherwise you're going to get, you know, you're going to get on the wrong boat. Well, and I would <laughs> you know say I mean? yeah. discipline and diligent and also figuring out if your thought process is really yours, you yeah. know, and really like, first of all, decide like, is the way that I think about things really mine? Mm -hmm. And do I, is this the way that I want to be in the world? Like, do yeah. I respect this person? Do I believe in this person? Like, do I actually honor the thoughts and frequencies that are emanating from this person? And then once I've come to a place where I do holding like, yeah, holding the discipline and mm -hmm. the, and the space around that, because it's like people really want to push up against you right now yeah, and, and almost force you into identities that maybe are not yours. Yeah. Oh, for sure. A hundred percent. And I mean, and that's, there's, um, <clears throat> there's no shortage of, you know, back and forths going on in every aspect of media, whether it's, you know, social media or the regular media or like all of it, you know? And it's, uh, yeah, it's a weird, it's a strange, strange time to, to feel as though um, you can't trust any, anyone else's opinions mm. to a large degree. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, I mean, that's, that's certainly not new, right? Like, I mean, we've, we've talked about this, like a huge foundation of, you know, um, paleo nutrition, right. Is saying, Hey, wait a minute. There's some, there's some bad recommendations going on here. And they've been sort of, viewed through an ancestral or, or, um, evolutionary template. Yeah. This probably doesn't make sense. The food pyramid. Right. So, I mean, there's definitely, you know, always this room to question authority and there's actually a responsibility, I think, to, to question and, and sort of investigate like the things that are sort of handed down to us from, mm -hmm. especially from government organizations, just because there's so much opportunity for mis like, well, for misunderstanding what bureaucracy the bureaucracy too, just right? Just the bureaucratic process, yeah. like absent any crony capitalism, absent any nefarious, you know, conspiracy. It's like, uh, but bureaucracies are like an amplified game of telephone. Mm -hmm. You know, you phone you do this and this and this, and it goes to this person. By the time it makes it out into the world, the, the guy who created it's like, what? that is what? not what I said. <laughs> this is not what we said. You know, yeah. so just as a emergent property of complicate on um, complex systems, information gets screwed up. Right? right. So we always need to be in a 
you know, keep an open mind about that and be in a position to think critically about it for ourselves and go, wait a second, maybe this is, let's, let's peel this back a second and see what was really going on here. And I think that the internet has given us a, um, a real double-edged sword with this whole thing, mm -hmm. because one, we have all of this access to information, so we can do our own due diligence. Uh, but unfortunately, and we've talked about this before, the where the information lies, right? Like where the, the root information lies is on C-SPAN. Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. reading PubMed. It's understanding the journals. It's doing, uh, having enough of a background in statistics to know the difference between relative risk and, and uh, mm -hmm. the other one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What is it? I don't relative, know. The relative, anyway, absolute risk, relative oh, yeah. and absolute risk, right? Because one, if you don't understand the difference between those two things, one study could make, meat look like it's i can't believe you're not already dead mm -hmm. or oh okay so your your chances of getting cancer from eating uh, a diet that include red meat go from 0.015 percent to 0.018 percent that's mm -hmm. a, you know what i mean yeah. like that's the difference between right. relative and and uh, absolute and absolute risk right so like you have to have all of this background and an ability to understand this stuff and the just the stomach for dealing with a C-SPAN level boredom quotient right? to read the information, right? Mm -hmm. And so then we end up following people who read the information and whether they want to or not, ultimately color it with their own interpretations and opinions. Mm -hmm. And then every level of that goes one deeper in the comments section. Somebody mm -hmm. has, oh yeah, I agree with that. What you said means this. Mm -hmm. No, it doesn't. Not at all. But then it runs from there, you know, and somebody reads and, and then they, re they remember it. And then they're in somebody else's Facebook feed and they're like, oh, hey, don't do this. And somebody's like, no, there's studies that say this. And they link the study. Nobody fucking reads it. And they're like, well, this guy's opinion has a study posted yeah, next to right, it, which right. no one totally. read and understands. Yeah. And you're like, oh, yeah. fuck, you know, yeah. and so we're in this, this weird <laughs> Situation. Basically, just explained like the bane of Adam's existence. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> you know, I was like, "This is not what this means." Like, you, 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 fuck, man, look at this. Like the the authors, even like this thing has been so misrepresented that the authors that wrote it in 2015, five years ago, got together and wrote a explanation of how this study and the information that they studied is pertinent today or not pertinent today because it's been so misrepresented. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, and that's, the, that's where yeah. we're at, you know? Yeah. And so like, how the hell do you know what to, yeah, who to believe and what to do? And so yeah. this, this idea of, you know, this, this discipline in critical thinking is no small task, you know? Yeah. Well, and then there's just this whole spiritual side of it, which is like, whatever you're looking for, you're going to find. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so like, this is this is, like, this is why for me, this whole thing is so interesting because it's just literally your proclivity towards a certain way of being is, is just so available to go deeper into that way right now. Mm -hmm. And like, that's why you're seeing the polarity so great is that people are just going deeper and deeper into what they are inclined to believe, inclined yeah. to think, inclined to get sucked into. Right. And like you said, the real, like the quote unquote truth is probably in this really boring gray box that yeah. <laughs> nobody uh, it, really wants to go into. It definitely <laughs> is like yeah. that. So the, the truth is always at the bottom of a really tall stack of papers in a boring gray box. Mm -hmm, you know, you're mm -hmm. just like, ah, shit, it's down there somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the truth, the, the truth from, you know, if you, there's always, a, what am I trying to say? It's, it's weird that you have to qualify truth now, yeah. but you really do mm -hmm. because there's, there's different interpretations of it. And there's people that outright don't think that there is truth to be had. Um, when I say it, <laughs> I mean, it's the most true thing that we can sort out through the scientific that process. we can measure. And, that, and yeah. I think that mm -hmm. that's like, I really, I just think it's the best system. You know, it's like if you want to believe something, that's different and nothing against that. Right. Like I believe this mm. because this and, and so, you know, faith falls into that category. Right. right. It's unprovable. It's just that's just not something that you're going to sort out with the scientific method. And if you want to have a belief, that's fantastic. But conflating 
belief with knowable truth is something that we see a lot now, right? People are like, no, this is true because I believe it. And you're like, no, that is actually different. You know, well, it's tricky because, you know, I think that there is a, um, paradigm that we have we've yet to learn how to measure right and so it kind of comes into this whole quantum theory and like really comes into just a whole different um idea about truth right so it's like this idea that your expectation of an object can actually change the behavior of it right yeah which is not uh, okay good well which is you know which we just don't completely understand. Like we don't understand how that works. And so yeah. it, it doesn't mean that it's not true. Right. Because they've seen, you know, um, I forget what the study was or whatever it's that there the was a double slit experiment. Right. Is yeah. What you're talking about. Yeah. And there's like, somebody's observing the electrons in this particular part of space, but it affects them in another part of space and yeah. they have no idea why. Yes. Right. So two different, two different things. And th this is actually really important, I think, because yeah. it gets, these things get talked about. And I'm, I know enough about quantum physics to know that I will never understand quantum physics. Exactly. You know? But yeah. there's like a couple of things here that get talked about a lot. So, one thing you're talking about is superposition. Yes, right? superposition. Where, where you can have an electron yes. or uh, you know some subatomic particle that seems to exist in two different places. Right? right. And like sometimes it's over here, sometimes it's over here. Right? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. But if you so, observe one of it, it can actually change the particles in the other space, right? Well, I don't know so that there's, much so about there are two either, different, So there are two okay. different things. So right. one, the, this thing could be spinning one direction – over here and mm -hmm. there's a probability that it's going to be spinning a different direction over here. Okay. Got it. And so mm -hmm. it all comes down to probabilities mm -hmm. and these, these probability waves. So it's, it's not that this is how I understand it. It's not that measuring it causes it to change. It's that it's, it's action and position in space is a probability. So at whatever time you measure it, there's a probability that it's going to be here. There's a probability that it's going to be here, right? So it appears to be different when you measure it mm -hmm. because you picked a snapshot in time, right? Of uh, Like you picked a point on the probability wave that it would be different if you picked a different point, mm -hmm. right? So it's not that the observation or the measurement changes it. It's that it's in a different place when you measure it, right? Okay, so but what's so, the one where you, where you actually... Okay, so like, for instance, remember we were watching that documentary, and they said that there was. Okay, you're you're gonna remember this better than me, so I'll just like kind of get through it, and you can correct me because you'll remember where they had something that was was it a plant in a certain part of the square? Yeah, and, and it followed the light, and yeah, and it followed the light, but what there was like. Oh, what was it though? I know what you're talking about. And I think we was had it the this... plant or was it something else? No, it was something about like, oh no, it was some kind of animal and they <laughs> paired it to, gosh, I wish I remember this. They I paired it to, um, like, I want to say it was like a vacuum or some, some kind of mechanical object and they paired the animal to it to like, so it was the first thing they saw, which creates the, like a bond. Oh, I it. have no idea. Oh gosh. I wish I remember this, but anyway, it was, it was something where basically this, I want to say it was like a vacuum or a, ro a robotic something that was completely randomized and when they paired the animals to it the animals like wanted it like it was a mother because they had bonded it with it mm -hmm. the the machine started going over to the the animals more frequently and it yeah. was like the expectation of the animals to want this machine to come close to them like right. affected its behavior yeah. yeah yeah so i remember watching a thing where there was a plant in a room and a light okay and the light moved, it was like on a moving head that could do everything. And it was moving randomly. Right. And over time, it started spending more time shining on the plant. Right. That's another one. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And 
I have no idea like what the hell is going on there. Right. You know what I mean? Okay. But there's, but this is, but this is what I'm saying though, okay. is like the common thing is the observer effect, right? That's what we talk about. So when you observe a particle, it changes it, right? That's what they call the observer effect, which mm-hmm. is what we were describing, which is not exactly, which is a misrepresentation of the double split, double slit experiment, which is that when you observe it, it is different, but it's not the observation that made it different. It's because particles act, act like waves. And that's the, that's the realization that's, that makes this whole thing super fucking weird is that it's not that, oh, how come when you measure something, something changes? It's why does this particle now act like a wave? That is, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. that's the bizarre part. Okay. Well, all I know is that whenever Penelope wanted my food <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and she intently thought about the food on my plate and how bad yeah. she wanted it, I would inevitably trip, fall, and some Job of my it. food know, would fall sure. off the plate. So all I'm <laughs> saying is that there's something to the intention, yeah. the energy of what you believe or what you intend. And if you can like focus it, right. that can actually change the reality of things. And yeah. I've experienced it with Penelope yeah. for 16 yeah, years totally. where I'm like, dude, how did you get me to drop that? Like, yeah. it's, I, un- I know it's, I've, it's- I've witnessed it. it <laughs> it's, it is super bizarre. And, and this, and this is the thing is that I don't think, and I, and so the physics becomes because it's difficult to understand and the, well, it, it's difficult for people like me to understand, you know what I mean? If Brian Greene was in here and we had this conversation, he would explain it exactly. He's like, no, 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 no. Yeah. This is not how it is. <laughs> this is how it is. Right. Which doesn't take anything away from everything else that we're saying. There are shit going on that we do not understand. Yeah, yeah. We just can't necessarily assign it to superposition or, you know, the double slit yes. experiment and say, this is why we can't explain shit. We're like, no, man, there's just shit going on. We don't understand. Yeah, totally. And I guess yeah. the whole point of this was that this is why I find it really hard to get super um, dedicated to one bandwidth of thinking or being in a camp or being of a certain mindset because I'm like, we don't even know. Like, we don't even know half of the reality that is happening right. in our world. And so, like, to get so mad at people, to be so irate, to, like, be so out of your mind around different topics right now, I'm just like... I actually just know enough to know that I, I don't really understand everything that's yeah. happening and I don't really have, it's hard for me to be so sure about a reality being a certain way when there's so much we don't understand. Yeah. Which I think, I think a lot of people can get behind that, but then, but then what do you but do? What do you do? Right. So like when it comes to, I mean, masks are the hot topic, right? So right. when it comes to a mask, if you land in the camp that you land in where you're like, man, I don't really know. I can see arguments on both sides. Then what do you do when you don't feel as though you have an expert to defer to? Well, I mean, honestly, for me, it's a really easy, it's really easy. I choose compassion. I go, it's like a whole different thing for me. So it's about like just really having compassion for the fact that people are really afraid. People feel really scared. And I'm like, you know, for me, it's like I can wear this mask and I can, I can, in my energy field, I can be about it being out of a place from love. Mm -hmm. And so like any negative effect that I could be convinced could potentially happen as an effect of wearing a mask, I can shift it so that for me, it's out of love. I am doing it out of love for people who I know don't feel safe in their body right now. Like yeah. I feel so safe in my body. I'm not, I'm not worried about coronavirus, but that's me. Like that's yeah. me feeling safe. I'm also not afraid to die. Yeah. So that's like, I have a completely right. different, <laughs> We're like dealing from, coming from a different place. I'm just coming from a different place. Yeah. yeah. Like I'm not like these, the, the common fears I think people have are not something that weigh as heavily for me. But what I do realize is that people are terrified of death. Mm-hmm. They're, so terrified of it that they're just willing to do whatever it takes to avoid it, even though spoiler alert, it's going to happen anyway. Yeah, It's coming. Yeah. 
And I just feel a lot of compassion for people who like this is lighting up some of their biggest fears in the world. And so I'm just kind of like, all right, I can be compassionate. And I don't, it doesn't come for me. It doesn't come from a place of like, you're taking away my rights. You're done. I'm just like, you know, I could really see how that's true also. Like I can right. really see how people would be really fundamentally rooted in that because I could see how that could light up those fears. Yeah. So, and so now you're in the compassion trap, right? Yeah. So like you have compassion for people who don't want to wear masks yeah. and you have compassion for people who do want to wear masks. Yeah. So where do you, like, how do you decide which compassion is more compassionate? Well, this is what's <laughs> funny. So I, I don't get angry at anyone. And if I see someone not wearing a mask, I'm not mad at them and I'm not upset. And I'm like, wow, that's really what you're, you're in your truth right now. Like I can't be mad at you for really feeling what you feel and believing what you believe. But you wear one, but I wear one compassion for people who are more afraid. Yeah. And I also wear one because I respect that that's just like the, the general stance legally that people have decided to take. And so I'm like, okay, I'm just going to respect that while we're still in this process of discovery so that, you know, I can just, yeah, I'm just not contributing to the chaos of it. I'm like, okay. And it doesn't, it doesn't create, um, a silencing in me. It doesn't create, in fact, sometimes I kind of like it. Yeah. (laughs) I like putting on my mask and feeling like I'm sort of incognito. I'm like, no one can see me. It's like sunglasses. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm kind of like, I don't know. It's sort of cool. (laughs) No one can see me. (laughs) Yeah. But like, that's just me. That's just me not being bothered by all of it. Because in the end, what I really believe is that none of this really matters. (laughs) We're all just playing the game of life right now. And like, we're all headed to the same place, which is death. Sorry, mm. sorry to say that, but right. like we're all just gonna, you know, do the best with what we can in the time that we have here and create in the best way we know. But eventually, we're all gonna die. So I'm just not like it. it I don't. I'm not. I'm not triggered by this whole thing, like so many people are. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, me either. I mean, yeah. I get I get triggered by stupid comments and social media. Actually, not even just social media. I mean, it's across the board now. There's just like really dumb stuff that's being being articulated as factual information. Mm -hmm. Um, And that annoys me. But I also am like, "Ah, whatever, that's my fault for digging into (laughs) into social media. It's like, you know, that this is exactly what you're going to find. The most depressing place to hang out right now is the worst. It's the absolute (laughs) worst. You know, I'm like, Facebook. But the one thing I am like clearly like cognizant of, though, is how many times we can look back in history and the whole like consensus was about reality. And this is the way things are. And you are an idiot if you can't see scientifically that this is correct. Right. And how many times we've looked back in history and thought, oh, my God, those idiots had no idea what they were talking about. And the person who was trying to buck the system was actually way right. more correct totally. than they could have figured out. And I'm like, it's not that hard for me to see tons of examples in this regard. So for people who can just staunchly dig their heels in and say, we know this scientifically, I'm like, we know that based on the data that is being presented in a certain way with certain ways of creating um, context for things and for the way that the scientific method exists now. That doesn't we don't actually, I mean, that's all we know. So I just, I get really, I just, you know, I just can see it as like, well, yeah, it's just obviously this is where we're at right now, but we might zoom yeah. out in 10 years and be like, oh my God. We oh, hundred percent. So, we will, we will do so that. lame, you know? Yeah. So, well, and I think that you actually, you, you kind of touched on an interesting point there because it's like, I, while I think that the scientific method is the best thing that we have going, right. It's just like capitalism. It's right. super flawed, but yeah. it's the best one yet. Yeah. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, exactly. And, and is there room to improve? Yes. Yeah. Are people always trying to improve it? Yes. Same with the scientific method. It's the best thing that we have for discerning whether something is is knowable and repeatable and measurable and all of those things, you know? However, like blind faith in it like, is not what it's about, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. So, I, well, I shouldn't say blind faith in a result or an outcome of the scientific process is not what it's about because that is, it's only true until it's proven not true. Mm -hmm. Right. And Mm -hmm. that's people are, 
testing that all the time. So I'm like, there's the, the scientific method, the rigors of science work. Mm. It's just slow and it ca- it requires constant reevaluation, you know, and we have these, uh, and, I, and so I think that physics actually, and maybe even astrophysics are a perfect example of the rigors of science working, right? Pluto's a planet. Pluto's not a planet. Pluto's a planet. Again. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. This is how it works. It yeah. plays out over time as new information comes in, the theories get tested, all these things, right? Physics and astrophysics are also an interesting sort of benchmark for that because there's there's not a lot of industry money in there mm-hmm, right there's mm-hmm. not a lot of studies there's not a lot of conflict of interest in is pluto a planet or not a planet right and so i think that it's almost pure in a way right mm-hmm. so you can let that those the scientific the science the, the physicists just sort of science it out you know and just give me an update every now and then neil degrasse tyson like what what do we know now yeah, oh yeah. that's weird you know, this, <laughs> we didn't know that before and now we do yeah but when we see this play out um, kind of on the public court as we have with coronavirus, I, I think that part of the deal is that people who are down with the scientific method or have just never really thought about it critically are seeing it play out. The rigors of science play out in failure after failure after failure. One little success. Nope, that's not right either. We're watching it happen. Yeah, to- totally. And it's like, Yes. This is just how it works. Mm-hmm. This is sciencing. Yes. You know, and there's a tremendous amount of of conflict of interest and competing sort of political interest in how it's all reported, right? Exactly. Yeah. But this is we don't normally see this. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like normally CNN does not cover whether or not Pluto's a planet or not yeah. on the day to day. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. okay. We just learned this. Yeah. Oh, still not a planet. Totally. Right. Like that, people would lose interest. They'd be like, ah, fuck, nobody knows anything about planets. And this is essentially where we're at with this virus, mm-hmm. right? Is people are like, I've been told this, I've been told that. This is these guys are all full of shit. I just don't, I don't know. Yeah. And you're like, no, this, this is the is, method. This is the process. Yeah. You know, this is how this well, works. Exactly. And this is where why I just get like I just feel like people who get so angry about their position. Yeah. It's just like I don't know. To me, that's just because you just are an angry person and this is a way a way to express your anger yeah. in some valid form. Right. Because science is actually quite boring and this process is super boring. Yeah. And like all of this day-to-day stuff is kind of just the gray minutia that you go through right. to figure stuff out. And so like if you're screaming at the top of your lungs about either side, that's just because you're actually coming up against the things that are making you really, really uncomfortable about reality and you right. feel like you need to express them in a validated way. Yeah, totally. So, I mean, this is cognitive dissonance, right? So mm-hmm. like when you attach to one thing, right? So you're presented with one idea and you're like, yeah, that makes sense to me and works for my ego or like whatever, whatever yeah. the attachment is that gets created to that. And then you're presented with different information. You're that actually makes you angry. Yeah. Right. So when, when cognitive dissonance arises, it's like, no, you know, you're attacking me now. Exactly. And that's a, and you're attacking my, the way that the view, the view of reality in which I hold that makes me feel safe or comfortable or seen or whatever. Yeah. I mean, this is like high level stuff. So I feel like this is again, what brings me back to the compassion is that I'm like, no, because people really, really feel this. Mm -hmm. It's true for them in the filter in which they see their reality. These things are very, very true and very pressing for them. And they're terrified and they can even find examples of why they're terrified because so-and-so's brother died and he was 30 with no medical problems. And so here's my proof that I should be terrified when in all reality, like, Ran- people die randomly all the time oh, of sure. things like yeah. all the time that it doesn't add up. So right. like, it's just what we're coming up, up against right now is the limitations of our humanity and how easy it is to be terrified by the fact that we're really not in control of this whole thing. Oh yeah. Like we are just yeah. flying around on a space ball yep. <laughs> dealing with whatever uh, the hell comes at us comes up. and yeah. trying to make sense of it and trying to remain somewhat calm because it's terrifying if you really realize yeah. what's happening. Oh, for sure. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's no doubt that it's like, 
Yeah. And so the best thing you could do is just get comfortable with the fact that we're all going to die. It's fine. <laughs> don't, don't be upset about it. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. I, I mean, no. well, I, you, you know me, like I, I think the denial of death is at the root of everything. But, yeah. but the reality, I think, for folks is that there's, you know, there, there's just you're not going to find an answer that's a hundred percent all the time. Yeah. You know, you're just, mm-hmm. you're just not. And yeah. there's, um, there's potentially a hazard in surrounding yourself by people who would lead you to believe that there is, Yeah, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And this is the echo chamber scenario, right? Yes. Like you get some cognitive dissonance, you get a couple of people with the same cognitive dissonance, and then they start echoing back and forth. And pretty soon they have a tribe yes. of people who are so right yep. in their wrongness, yep. or even if they're not wrong, but the, in their convictions that now there's, you know, a hill to die on. Yeah. And that is, I mean, we just see that play out, you know, 250 times a day in, yeah. you know, any given Facebook thread. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, I feel like we uh, we ran this one ashore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we have beached this well. <laughs> We've uh, officially beached this well, you know. And if we're um, anything that we're saying is triggering to you out there, it's you know upsetting to you. Just know that that's not our intention at all. We just are actually trying to give voice to the real dilemma that is mm-hmm. life, you know, and the fact that we all are just coming from it with our own triggers, our own emotional wounds, our own fears, and our own philosophies and joy and love and celebrations. And we're just yeah. all coming to it the best way we know how. And hopefully the point of this is just to have some more compassion for each other because Whatever people are feeling, they're feeling it because it's real for them. Yeah. It's very true for them. And so, you know, like if you can feel what you feel in your heart and the things that you are fundamentally so assured of, then just know that the people that you're maybe butting heads with are feeling the exact same way. And can you find some compassion mm-hmm. with the fact that maybe they're on the other side of the spectrum, but they're feeling just as as fervently about this thing as you are. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And you can um, just stand six feet away from them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's fine. And it's fine. Wash your hands when yeah. you go home. Don't touch your eyes. <laughs> exactly. So it's kind of all the same stuff. So what is something you want to leave the audience with today just on what this coronavirus, what this last six months, what the loss of Penelope, the changing of energy, like what is just something that you want to leave mm. people with or that you're taking away from this time period when you reflect back on it now? Oh, yeah, let's see. Um, I mean, I mean, I'm entitled to say that you just really need to think for yourself mm-hmm. <laughs> in everything. Mm-hmm. Um, however, I know that that may be less than compelling to <laughs> <laughs> not, you know, not because people aren't willing to do it, but because it's kind of obvious, right? But maybe, maybe not even like advice, but like for you, what, what is like the, pr- one of the most profound things that you're taking away from this, you know? Mm. I mean, honestly, it's, it's more like just confirmation, you know, that, that no matter what is is going on or that you think you have going on or that, you know, like no matter what is uh, momentum you have or, um, you know, the odds are in my favor or they're not in my favor or, you know, like no matter what your mindset is around the trajectory of your life, if that mindset is rooted in external factors extrinsic Mm -hmm. motivations, um, be ready for it to, to get swatted out of the air, you know, because it's, uh, these are all the things that we just can't control. Mm -hmm. And so if you're looking for control, if I'm looking for control over my destiny and the outcomes in my life, the only reliable place is internally, right. Is my, reaction to the Mm -hmm. external world. That's Mm -hmm. the 
only thing that you really actually have control over. And ultimately, I think that um, that's probably the most important one, mm. you know, and that's something that I, I at the root of it all, right, this like we were talking about in the beginning of the podcast that I'm just sort of wired up to expect curveballs, right? That wiring is how I react to the curveballs. Mm. It's not that I'm an expert curveball hitter. You know what <laughs> I mean? It's that I just, whether it's a, a matter of, of training or life experience or a combination of all of those things, it's the reaction to it is the only mm. thing, you know, your own internal reaction is the only thing you can control in all of this. So mm. grab the steering wheel. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Yeah. It's so important. Yeah. I mean, and that it sucks, <laughs> frankly, you know, because it means complete ownership. Yeah. Right. Of mm -hmm. everything that's going on. It's like, totally. If you're, if something shitty happens yeah, and you're taking responsibility for the way that you react to that shitty thing. Yeah. You're going to have a real hard time going, Oh man, everything sucks. Mm -hmm. And this person did this and blah, 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 which all may be true things, right. but you're masking the fact that you're not taking responsibility for your reaction. Mm. You know? Mm. Yeah. So good. Mur, mur, mur. It's so good. <laughs> I mean, Honestly, though, like how empowering is that, that you actually are the creator of your life when you realize that, Yeah. when you take ownership of that every moment yeah. is your creation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's the, and it's funny because it's actually, it's like a leadership principle, you know, mm -hmm. that, um, has been beat into me over the years. It's <laughs> like, and actually Jocko Willink wrote an entire book on it mm -hmm. called in extreme ownership, which is like, that's what he considers leadership mm. like you own everything 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 yeah. mm -hmm. there's nothing that happens under your command that's not your responsibility mm. and that's how it, that's your brain yeah you know what i mean if you yeah. want if you want to be in control if you want to be in command of your mind then you have to take 100 percent responsibility for everything that comes out of it you mm -hmm. know so good luck <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome yeah what about you um, I think the thing that I would say, and, and I'm saying this to myself, but I'm, and this is really what I've gotten out of this time. And, but I'm saying it to others because I want them to hear this for themselves too, is that you, just you, who you are in this moment is enough. You do not have to create anything. You don't have to change the way you look. You don't have to show up for anything in a different way. You, as you are, just in this moment, sitting there, listening to this podcast, are perfect and enough and completely lovable and divine and unique and you don't have to prove your worth and you don't have to create something in order to be special. Like you are enough. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is what I've taken away from this last time, this last six months is that I'm enough. I don't have to create 20 more retreats that everyone had the time of their life on. I don't have to make 10 more programs that, you know, teach people about how awesome they are. I don't have to actually do anything to be complete and to be loved. Yeah. And well, that's good. I hope that people <laughs> out there feel that for themselves because yeah. we are running around using so much energy to convince people that we are worthy. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. And you're just already worthy. Yeah, it's really true. Yeah. And it's such a, it's such an interesting artifact of, I mean, I think that the, there's nothing new about that, right? Like we've ever since the tribe got bigger than like 150 people, <laughs> we've yeah. all really felt the need to kind of carve out our, our piece of, um, importance. Mm -hmm. Right. But man, has that gotten blown out of proportion? You know, it's like, all you have to do is pick up any sort of electronic device with a screen on it and you will be presented with an image of why you are not, mm, mm -hmm. you know, 
yeah. good enough one yeah. way or the other. Yeah. So it's an uphill slog, you know? Mm, totally. Yeah. I mean, it's just, and it's such a beautiful gift to give yourself to just fully receive the recognition that you aren't broken. You don't have to fix yourself. Like yeah. you're just perfect. You're beautiful. You're amazing. You are loved. You are love. Like yeah. you already are. So now just do what you want to do. Yeah. Do what, do what is inspiring. Do what's beautiful. Do what brings joy to your heart or that you feel inspired to share with others. But don't feel like you have to do something to be enough in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that like, I don't know anyone that has like gone down this path and really truly started to believe just in themselves and really truly feel that, that they are enough and really own everything that you're just talking about. I don't know anyone who has done that and not created something fucking awesome. Exactly. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, it's not like this situation of like, Oh, but if I just accept everything, then what am I going to do? Just go sit under the Bodhi tree and you're like, well, maybe, but, but probably not. Like yeah. odds <laughs> are you're going to create something really awesome because that's the, that's where it all comes from. Yeah. Know, is that like that uh, fountain head, so it, to speak. Yeah. And then, you know, Adam and I are in the eye of it right now with the fact that like, we don't really know what we're doing. <laughs> yeah. you well, know? we know what we're doing. Well, we know what we're doing, but we don't really know how the world is going to respond to it. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Which, but yeah. in complete trust and surrender that we are creating from a place of love and inspired knowing and that like, we're just going to keep coming from that place and allowing and trusting that that energy is what sparks the next steps in our life yeah. and sparks in our community. And, and it's just, you know, we're, we're in it right now. Like mm -hmm. we're living it, you know? And so don't feel like you'll be alone out there. Yeah, <laughs> you just yeah. surrender to it all. Yeah. Well, you <laughs> we'll know, be it, there with it's, you. <laughs> it's true. Well, Cause it is, it is interesting, right? Like, so we, we have interactions on pretty deep levels with, a lot of people through yeah. our coaching. Right? Yeah. And so, uh, you know, and, and it's, I think to some degree, it's a little bit different than just having a whole bunch of friends that you talk to, right? Mm -hmm. Because we're, we're really like trying to help people solve problems and help them, help them solve them themselves. Right. So we are exposed quite a bit to kind of how a broad sampling of people all over the world are being affected by everything that's mm -hmm, going on. Mm -hmm. And it is sort of the common denominator is that it looks different for everybody, but there's just hit after hit after hit mm -hmm. that have been coming for yeah. folks, you know, and mm -hmm. it's, and it's also to me really interesting that they're being served up, you know, these hits are coming at just enough that you can take it, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, yeah. there are people who are being absolutely decimated financially or in some other aspect of like whatever's going on, right. There are these things that are, that are occurring, but I think in a couple of years, we look back, I think that the overall impression will be that everybody got just enough that this is a hormetic stressor. A therapeutic dose. Yeah. Therapeutic dose. You know, <laughs> yep. but something that you could come back from. Yeah. You know, totally. whether one way or the other. And even if that means that you're, you know, bankrupt and decimated, some other aspect of your life came back in a way yeah. that, that um yeah, maybe they, was what was needed. Exactly. You know? so maybe know. all of the things that were keeping your financial abundance were things that were killing you. Right. Or, you know, I mean, who knows? Like everybody has their different story, but I think there's so much opportunity for self-acceptance and self-love that's coming out of this time that if you're just willing to see it, it's not going to be difficult to decipher that that's coming yeah. for you. Yeah, It's just uncomfortable because change is uncomfortable and growth is sometimes painful. And like, is, is if we can just get comfortable with that, then it's going to be so much easier. Yeah. So All right. we're done. Yep. We've, we've beached and crawled partway <laughs> past the high water line. <laughs> we love you guys. We're thinking about you all. Know that you're enough. Know that you're beautiful and know that whatever's coming at you right now is just the right thing and you can handle it and you have a hundred percent success rate of figuring it out just it's like true. we do. Yep. That's a fact. <laughs> all right, guys. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.